It's the spring of 1967, the dawn of the fabled summer of love, and of course, the biggest band in the world is getting in on the fun. Tucked away in EMI Studio 2, the Beatles toil away at their defining statement of psychedelia, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Dressed in colorful stripes and polka dots, they put classics like With a Little Help from My Friends, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, and Lovely Rita to tape. Not to mention feet of engineering and musicianship a day in the life. But next door, in Studio 3, another band is at work, making their own psych record. One that will put them in the same circle as Keith Emerson, the Jimi Hendrix Experience, they'll even cross paths with the Fab Four themselves, will become some of the biggest names in rock and roll history, their careers forever changed by the brief but brilliant presence of their especially whimsical frontman. But I don't want to skip ahead. For now, they're just the Pink Floyd. Hi, I'm Abby, I have a lot of records, and this is Vinyl Monday. So welcome back, or welcome if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is the who, what, when, where, why, and how do I feel about classic albums in my collection. If 30 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds here on my channel, over on Instagram, where my last episode was Zappa approved. Ah, thank you, thank you, no, thank you. But really, that Zappa Instagram page feature would not have happened without the support of you viewers. Thank you so much, and thank you to whoever manages that social media page for thinking my content was good enough. We have a lot to get through today, and I think that intro did a good enough job, so this week's album is... The Pink Floyd, The Piper at The Gates of Dawn. Oh, the 60s, every band name had to have a the. Congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, if you wanna play along, all you gotta do is check out my community tab. That's where I post my hints to what next week's album is gonna be. I host polls where sometimes you get to pick what's on the series. I make announcements when I'm places that aren't here. You can find all of that on my channel. So. Why am I reduxing this? The original Piper video was one of the first five episodes of Vinyl Monday on YouTube. It was Satanic Majesties, Kick Out the Jams, Led Zeppelin 3, Are You Experienced, and this. The original's production value is shoddy, the writing is worse, the only thing I really got bang on was the fit. I can't leave the original B and have a clear conscience. Piper deserves the research, it deserves the thorough examination, it needs to be up to the standards of my current work, and a second go around is the only way to do it. In short, I'm doing it for Sid! Let's take the plastic off. I have two copies of Piper, both equally special to me. This was my first, with an admittedly tattered cover, it was quite well loved before making its way to me, is an original US copy in stereo. I bought this from the record store right down the street from my college campus on Record Store Day 2019. That store doesn't stock RSD releases, but they run a pretty good discount, good enough that a college kid could afford this in her stack. My second copy, much nicer to both look at and play, is a stereo copy from Germany. Looking at the blue labels, this is the second 1967 run. One of you subscribers sent this along to me from your personal collection, and this is where it gets interesting. It came in this sleeve with the address of a music store on Champs-Élysées in Paris. That means that this copy of Piper started in Germany, made its way over to France, then the United States, and then to me. This might be my art history nerd showing, but I love when I can trace the provenance of stuff in my collection like this. So let's talk about this cover art. The front cover was photographed by Vic Singh. Vic shared a studio with portrait photographer David Bailey. He photographed 60s 
mega stars like The Stones, Andy Warhol, and top models Gene Shrimpton and Twiggy. David photographed the Beatles some years before, and Vic was friends with George Harrison. The lens used to photograph the Piper cover was a gift from him. Not unlike Carl Ferris styling the experience for another psychedelic album cover, Are You Experienced? Vic passed some notes along to Floyd's managers, Peter Jenner and Andrew King. They were to send the guys to the studio in the brightest clothes they could find, and this is what they came up with. Glittering jackets in silver, black, green, and gold, paisley ascots, and splashes of crimson red. Totally psychedelic 60s. I can't imagine the task was too terribly difficult, considering the guys' wardrobes. This was long before Roger discovered the plain black t-shirts that he'd be wearing all almost exclusively for the next 50 plus years. The back cover was illustrated by Sid Barrett. Abstracted arms, hands, and feet. There's some differences between the UK and the US back covers. I'll just show those in the B-roll. On the Piper at the Gates of Dawn, we have the original lineup of Pink Floyd. That's Sid Barrett on vocals, guitar, and percussion. Roger Waters on bass, backing vocals. <laughs> if you can call them that. Gong and lead vocals on Take Up Thy Stethoscope and Walk. Richard Wright on piano keys, including Farfisa, Lowry, and Hammond organs. The harmonium, percussion, including vibraphone, cello, and co-lead vocals with Sid on Matilda Mother, and Nick Mason on drums and various percussion, including maracas and timpani. Our special guest is manager Peter Jenner, providing the voice of the astronaut for a strong Domini. Piper at the Gates of Dawn was produced by ex Beatle engineer Norman Smith, engineered by Pete Brown. Roll transition. The following sentence will frame everything we talk about today. Roger Waters and Sid Barrett were boys together. They were each other's counterparts. Roger the cynic, Sid the lighthearted optimist. Rog was more solemn and serious, Sid extroverted and bubbly. Roger moves out to London in 1961-ish, Sid follows him out there the next year, where they link up with drummer Nick Mason and keys player Rick Wright. Lead guitarist Bob Close was in the fray as well. There was a five-piece Floyd before David Gilmore? Yes! But they only cut one demo together, Lucy Leave. Bob brought kind of a Rolling Stones feel to the mix. In 63-ish, all the guys moved into an apartment together. In 65, when Bob left the band and Sid took the helm of the not yet Floyd, they set their controls to this burgeoning new thing called psychedelia. It was no secret Sid was a man of substance. The guys would invite their landlord to dinner and Sid would just roll him a stupidly fat joint while he cooked. Who was their landlord? Architect Mike Leonard. He was getting into lighting design and wanted to set experimental music to his light shows. Who better to do it than the band Living Downstairs? That's where this groovy BBC segment came from. Providing the music, a group which features a range of unusual sound effects, the Pink Floyd. In 66, the now christened Pink Floyd with light show in tow became fixtures at the freakouts popping up around London. Enter manager Peter Jenner. He was buddies with music producer Joe Boyd, who was looking for a house band for his UFO club. And what a show Floyd put on. Sid used a Zippo lighter as a slide and affixed mirrors to his Esquire to reflect the light from the light show. One of the Yardbirds saw this and gave his telly the same treatment. I don't know why, but I feel like we should keep an eye on this guy. Joe produced a demo for Floyd, Arnold Lane. It became their first single in March. It's a lot more mid-60s British pop than psych. I could see the kinks doing this one. You know, even if it's about a creep who steals his neighbor's panties off their clothes lines. Nevertheless, it grabbed the attention of EMI. A relatively new band getting signed by the Beatles label? That's a big deal! But it doesn't mean the deal was good. A 5,000 pound advance, that's a little over $96,000 in today's money, to be issued in installments over five years. Uh, they'd get very little in royalties. But this was weird by 60s standards. Though they 
they'd have to pay out of pocket for their studio time. That much is normal, right? But once they were in the studio, Floyd had free reign to do whatever. Floyd headed into the studio in late February 67 for a project with the working title Projection. I assume that was inspired by their light shows. The guys plus engineer Pete Brown took that do whatever you want thing and ran with it. With the facility's echo chamber, extensive double tracking, and this newfangled thing called stereo, stereo. they came up with some really cool sh**. Beatle Paul McCartney in the middle of his own psychedelic phase was an early champion of Floyd. The guys sat in on the recording of Lovely Rita on March 21st. This inspired their own quirky take, Power Talk H and, being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, inspired the arrangement of Bike. As willing as Norm and Pete were to let Floyd be weirdos, there was a constant struggle between the guy's musical approach and the need for viable album-length songs. Interstellar Overdrive, in particular, was a point of contention. Norm rejected all five original takes of Interstellar as they were all too long, Floyd resented this. Here's what Pete had to say about first hearing it. Quote, I opened the door and nearly sh** myself. This reminds me of Floyd's spot on BBC's Look of the Week. Why has it all got to be so terribly loud? Well, I don't guess it has to be, but I mean, that's the way we like it. The answer was simple. Floyd was a club act. They were used to playing for the back of the room. In an attempt to guide the guys towards something with commercial potential, Norm sat at the piano and jammed with them. Raj and Rick were especially receptive to this. All through production, Sid was doing, doing the, Sid. the Sid. He was similar to Jim Morrison in the sense that he wanted to see how far he could push it find the line and maybe step over it. But Sid wasn't driving drunk and crashing into cop cars. He was getting whacked out in the name of art. He was kind of the archetypal psychedelic musician in this sense. He did the Sid and it expanded his already extant creativity. He found an avenue of self-expression. In the 11th hour, Projection was retitled after chapter seven of one of Sid's favorite books, The Wind in the Willows. The track listing of The Piper at the Gates of Dawn goes after as follows. Opening up side one, we have Astronomy Domini, followed by Lucifer Sam, then Matilda Mother, next Flaming, then Power Talk H, and side one closes with Take Up Thy Stethoscope and Walk. Opening up side two, we have Interstellar Overdrive, followed by The Gnome, then chapter 24, next the Scarecrow, and the album closes with Bike. Things get a little funky when we look at the US track listing. Opening up side one, we have See Emily Play, followed by Power Talk H, then Take Up Thy Stethoscope and Walk. Next, Lucifer Sam, and side one closes with Matilda Mother. Opening up side two, we have The Scarecrow, then The Gnome, next chapter 24, and the album closes with Interstellar Overdrive. So why are the track listings different? In the 60s in England, the record biz just didn't issue the singles on the LPs. Singles were meant to entice people to buy the record. Here in the States, labels included the singles but cut other songs, chopping and scrambling the track listings so they can then peddle compilations. There were some special, especially messy cases, but no matter the details, the root of it all was money for the label. The best example of this, of course, the Beatles catalog. Capitol ripped I've Just Seen a Face from Help and slapped it onto Rubber Soul to make it a more straightforward folk rock album. But when UK Rubber Soul made landfall here in the States around 1970, people were surprised to hear Drive My Car kicking off the record. Another edit for the market case that comes to mind is Are You Experienced? The UK track listing is much more bluesy, US more straight psychedelic. To this day, people are still arguing over what is the canon track listing of this record. Sgt. Peppers did a lot to standardize track listings moving forward, but Floyd just didn't have that kind of weight to throw around, so in August we got the UK single See Emily Play on the US Piper. I get See Emily Play, I get it and you don't, we dumped your tea in the harbor! But in 1973, after Smash hit Dark Side of the Moon drummed up interest in Floyd's back catalog, we got 
a nice pair with the original Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Kind of. For some reason, us dumb Americans still didn't get Astronomy Domini. We got the live recording from Amagama. NME, Record Mirror, Cashbox, all the biggest music publications of the day gave Piper glowing reviews upon release. But by the end of production in May, Sid was visibly unwell. Promoting Piper was going to be a problem. Floyd had a tour of the States booked in November. Jimi Hendrix broke through in America in May via a blazing performance at the Monterey Pop Festival. If Floyd could break through in the States through this mini tour, they'd be riding the gravy train. It was to start at the Fillmore West, but at the show, Sid detuned his guitar and strummed the same chord the whole time, royally pissing off Bill Graham. If I had a nickel for every time someone on this series pissed off Bill Graham, he was just doing odd shit like that. So the guys go, okay, clearly this isn't gonna work. Too Tours cancelled, we will regroup and try Europe instead. The opportunity arose in the form of a package tour with The Move, The Nice, and The Jimi Hendrix Experience, plus New Kids on the Block, Air Apparent, and Outer Limit. At the very least, this tour produced this bonkers photo of all the groups together. Neither Jimmy nor Nick were ready for the photo. Raj looks like I offended him. Oh Jesus Christ, he was already wearing the black t-shirts. Sid is staring through my soul. Noel Redding is straight great chillin', and Rick is falling asleep on his feet, let that man take a nap. But other than that photo, this tour was not great for Floyd, Sid especially. In the words of Tony Secunda, quote, They were worried about Sid, but needed to keep the band's name out there, but nobody knew if he was up to it. The general feeling was that he wasn't. He'd wander aimlessly around the town they were playing in, sometimes he'd show up to the gig, if he didn't, they'd just play the instrumentals and call it a night. Uh, they also had a light show and a new Raj composition to lean on, set the controls for the heart of the sun. Apples and Oranges was released in a bid to capitalize on the tour. It flopped. All the guys have admitted in later years that they should have been more accommodating to Sid and not rushed him into a 21 date tour so soon after what happened in California. But in their defense, the 60s were a different time. People just didn't talk about mental health then the way we do now. There were several attempts to get Sid into treatment. He refused them all. Uh, again, there's a very different attitude surrounding therapy these days. Problems continued through production of the follow-up, A Saucer Full of Secrets, until Sid had to exit the band. It seems he did too much of a drug that was too strong in the 60s, and it exasperated something that was already there. Thus, Piper at the Gates of Dawn is the only Pink Floyd album that features Sid Barrett as a full-time member of the band. This is either remembered as a hidden gem of the Floyd catalog or one of their weakest, most dated albums. It depends what kind of Floyd fan you ask. So, what do I think of Piper? <laughs> Going in. Of course I have a soft spot for Sid. In case you haven't noticed, I'm a whimsical bitch, and Sid Barrett is patron saint of whimsical bitches. I remembered I liked Piper a year and a half ago, but didn't remember why. To begin with, is Piper a concept album? Literally no. It does not have a consistent theme or a central plot character or question, it's just sonically cohesive. It was only ever called a concept album because people got blasted on the Sid and wanted to hear this whole thing front to back. That's it! Piper is high psychedelia in its purest form. It sometimes loses its way and sometimes finds its way back. We hear elements that were really only acceptable in 1967 and got dunked on pretty hard after. Think sound collages and an affinity for the Baroque. Norman Pete's influence, for better or for worse, gave this thing more direction than it would have had otherwise. And it bore kind of an identity crisis. This wasn't at all representative of what Floyd could and did do at their shows. A lot of this stuff was never performed live. Additionally, there are weak spots in the production. Very obvious cuts in Matilda Mother and Interstellar, and clumsy late pans in Lucifer Sam. Starting our track-by-track -track breakdown with Astronomy, a bold and daring opener for such a green band. This one has really grown on me since I last evaluated Piper. We drop the needle on barely audible transmissions 
emissions from space and what sounds like Morse code. The 60s were obsessed with space. This is one of those artifacts that places this album firmly in the 60s. Sid's lyrics using all sorts of rhyme schemes with lime and limpid green, a second scene, a fight between the blue you once knew are hypnotic quite soft to listen to. This will continue throughout our journey today. Then we're whizzing past Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus beyond our solar system. I dig how Nick's drums were treated on Piper, this being one of the more audible examples. You have the booming start, but listen to how hollow they are of this whole song. The tension the harmony vocals give the final verse, punctuated by cymbal crashes up the ante. Bring the drama. Astronomy is one of the high points of early Floyd for sure. Lucifer Sam is the most focused number on the record. I wrote this in my notes on day one could have been a James Bond theme. Then for one of my last listen throughs while I had my dad over, he said, sounds like James Bond. It's spooky and effortlessly cool. As a best way, ugh, this is such a groover. Everyone's on the same page for this one, but the rhythm section is especially locked in. Nick is crashing away at the final verse and Raj is just tearing it up. You're not so sure about Matilda Mother in the beginning, but by the end, it's enchanting. It captures how entranced we were by bedtime stories as kids. I get that from the descending guitar line. Props to the exotic organ solo and the creative ch <sighs> One of my favorite moments on all of Piper is the soaring <laughs> And one last solo snuck in. Sid could sometimes slip into Disney territory with his writing, see the scarecrows and gnomes and sh** where he shone was capturing a child's perspective without dumbing it down. I don't believe this ability came from mental illness. To chalk it up to that would be an unjust infantilization of the mentally ill. I simply think Sid was a rare breed who held that fascination by the world into his adulthood. This quality shines on flaming. Thank you for the vocabulary lesson, Sid. I now know what an Ida down is. From the train whistles to breezy acoustic, twinkling bells, ad libs that flit in and out and slightly unsettling lyrics, this song is what it was like being a weird kid. Speaking of weird, <laughs> what in the wheat toast hell is this? I think the only constant in all of Pink Floyd's history is Roger Waters and his inhale scream. For how odd power is, it's also somehow Land. The piano doesn't move this anywhere. It is quite literally a waste of space. The Roger Penn stethoscope is a glimpse at the more famous Floyd iteration to come. This is a number with pieced together listing lyrics about what I think is a hangover. The snare hits and creative set it on an off-kilter path carried forward by the music barely held together amidst wily solos. This is one of the more memorable bass lines on the record. Interstellar fucking rips. A chugging riff and the nastiest fuzz tone I've ever heard on a bass. Forget nasty, it's disgusting. It's ironic these guys were architecture students as this song's weak spot is its lack of structure. It ventures off into deep space and though we get that riff again at the end, it didn't quite come back. Interstellar is tense and dark, which sticks out on a happy-go-lucky record like this. Take those qualities, plus the deep space vibes, and you have the Pink Floyd blueprint. We still associate those traits with them in our year of the Lord 2024. Uh, where echoes, off metal, and obscured by clouds are the proto-dark side, Interstellar is the proto Echoes. This song was better live. It was a lot more overdrive than Interstellar. This is where the sequencing bugs me. We go right from this spacey, heavy psych freak out to this? I'm not a fan of Scarecrow, Chapter 24, or The Gnome, and that's because, for some confounding reason, both versions of Piper decided to keep all of these tracks and keep them all together. <sighs> They'd be more endearing were they not all blocked together. Around here in the album, my dad looked at me and asked, 
So when do we start putting bricks in the wall? Chapter 24 is the weakest of them all. It's a bunch of recitations from the I Ching and not much else. I'm all for Eastern philosophy and culture in my 60s rock and roll C. George Harrison's sitar phase. But given the great potential from the source material, Chapter is somehow the most flavorless tune on Piper. The Scarecrow is my favorite of these musically. The syncopated block percussion, quirky country Joe keys, and airy harmonies harmonies were decades ahead of their time. Their very 2000s indie pop boom, I can see why Sid found a cult following there. But again, the lyrics are weak. And Gnome is a song about a gnome named Grimble Grumble. I don't have much to say about that. Is Sid as formidable a songwriter as Raj? I think it's unfair to say he's not, despite this epic streak of stinkers. For the most part, it's a sequencing and tone issue. He's just different. He wasn't trying to be like, society, man, seven minute guitar solo. His songs were more inquisitive, magical, fun. That comes with its hits and misses, especially when you have sequencing that really doesn't count for the tone. My favorite of the overtly Sid tracks is Bike, because it is Sid. Silly and unpredictable. When you pick through the lyrics, it will become one of the funniest songs you've ever heard, because the narrator is trying to get with this girl, right? But he's so screwed up over her that he's just word vomiting all over the place. <laughs> I know a mouse and he hasn't got a house. I don't know why I call him Gerald. He's getting quite old. You're very pretty. Bike is just fun. The topsy-turvy arrangement, the big... <laughs> before barking out more obtuse observations, I love it. It does get a little unsettling at the end with that insane goose. It was bound to go off the rails at some point. And that's Piper. My preferred track listing is neither. I've come to the conclusion that there is no good sequencing of Piper between both versions I have. The better side A goes to the original, it's got a better opening for sure. Where US Piper has a leg up is the inclusion of C. Emily Play and Interstellar as the closer. Just give it a try, it's killer. You know, the hardest part of this video wasn't the listening or the research or anything like that. It was hearing how adored Sid was by the people who knew him. He had a bounce in his step. He was thoughtful and sweet. David looked up to him and always made sure Sid got his royalty checks. Rick said, quote, My memory in my head of Sid is what he was like before he went crazy. I haven't seen him grow up since he was 24 years old, so my memories of him are very warm. This messed with me because I'm 24. Roger talking about Sid hurt because this generation of Floyd fans, myself included, uh, sees him as horseman, sing about dead dad. And he's earned the reputation of an egotistical jerk, especially in the last year, so it's easy to dunk on him. But talking about Sid, he sheds his ego and fondly remembers the boy he once knew. I saw a bit of heart in him I hadn't seen before. We're so lucky Sid gave as much to the world as he was able to. Piper and his solo albums. I happen to own Madcap and Barrett as a double release. Uh, I've gotten many requests over the years to do a Sid Barrett episode. Now I have the means. One of the biggest what ifs in all of rock and roll history is a second honest to goodness Sid Barrett Pink Floyd record. Sure, we have Saucer Full of Secrets, Sid is on that, but it's more so just evidence of a five piece Floyd's existence and the beginning of a four year floundering period after Sid's departure. The what if I don't hear nearly as much. What if we got another record with Sid, but it was a joint Sid Barrett Roger Waters Floyd. It might have reflected an observation Nick made, quote, we carried on two musical careers at the same time, referring to the astronomy interstellar side and the Arnold Lane Siemily play bike side. With the hypothetical two lives of a Sid Roger Floyd, we might have gotten half a record of Sid's whimsy and very 60s attitude of everyone, everyone opening, opening their, their minds, minds how you save the, the world, world and end the war, war man. man. 
and half a record of Raj saying, Modern life is fucked, corruption is everywhere, the procession of time is inescapable. Both are valid perspectives, and a Floyd where both were given equal weight would be so compelling to hear. Is Piper a product of its time? Yes. This would not fly today. This wouldn't have even worked in 1968 after the mass loss of innocence following the Summer of Love. It's almost as if taking massive amounts of psychedelics causes unprecedented ego death. Who would have thought? It might not work with any other band in any other year, but as the listener, you have fun with the occasional miss of the mark here because it's playful. I don't think there's any other Floyd record you could call playful. Piper is special because when you wade past the overt whimsy that might be a turn off for some of us more world weary, you get the core of what Pink Floyd is and always was. Sound hounds with an affinity for space, a latent darkness, whether caused by looking down a rabbit hole or into the black hole. The bravery to do such, and through light and dark, Piper is utterly inspired. My personal favorites off this one are Astronomy Domini, Lucifer Sam, Flaming, Interstellar Overdrive, and Bike, an honorable mention to See Emily Play. Remember, if you want to keep up with all of my favorites from all the Vinyl Mondays, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week, except on Tuesday when Neil Young came back to Spotify, then I added all of the stuff from The Harvest and everybody knows this is Nowhere episodes. Ugh, between Zappa and Neil and this, it's been an exciting week all around. That is it. That is Pink Floyd's first record, Piper at the Gates of Dawn. What do you think of this album? What do you think of Sid's Floyd? Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about albums that I love. And remember, despite what some guy on the internet tells you, your opinion matters. If you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you next week. Bye!